Hi, Sasha. Hi, Stella. So today we're going to set our audience up for what's coming. We have a conversation with Dr. Mike Bailey, and we wanted to talk to him specifically about a paper that he recently published along with Susanna Diaz. That's a pseudonym. Um, and it was a survey of parent reports, something like 1600 parents talking about their ROGD kids or kids they suspect have ROGD. And this paper is really important because it's a much larger sample that really kind of corroborates what Dr. Littman's study showed in 2018. But we also talked about this possibility that the paper could be retracted. So there was a kind of campaign online with a lot of activists who wrote an open letter to the publisher of this paper, trying not only to get the paper retracted for reasons which don't make a lot of sense, but also to get Dr. Zucker, who's the editor of the paper, removed from his position. And I think what was important about this conversation for me, because I'm not an academic, I don't always understand what does it mean for a paper to be retracted? Why would papers ever be retracted? And Mike kind of goes through the findings of the paper, what the complaints were about. And then what I thought was really cool is he kind of explained in the bigger picture, the context of like, why would a paper ever be retracted? And really we were talking about big things like completely making up data or plagiarism, which were neither present in his paper at all, right? So that was really important. And we also ended up talking um, a little bit about autogynephilia, which is like this very controversial thing. And we wanted to take a minute and actually explain what it was. So Stella, can you tell our listeners what is autogynephilia? Because we don't really define it very clearly when we start talking about it. Um, autogynephilia, simply term, put, is the male propensity to be sexually aroused by the idea of themselves as a woman. And that can extend to um, womenly kind of pursuits, what they believe is womenly pursuits, or, you know, all sorts of different ways, whether it could be having period or breastfeeding or just simply in their sexual kind of sense. You know what I mean? And they, they are turned on by this. It's massively... It, it evokes a huge amount of emotion in people. People get very, very disturbed around it. I do want to say that Ray Blanchett, first of all, you know, coined the term and uh, his, his paper went back as far as 1989, if my memory serves me correct. And then Mike Bailey, who we are interviewing today, he released The Man Who Would Be Queen in 2003. And that was a very in-depth account of what would be now, you know, what, what is it, autogynephilia. And we've had him on before, and I think he really gets into a lot of quite difficult questions that you and I have around, well, hang on, is it ROGD? Is it autogynephilia? Is there a mix? How does porn impact this? So we, I think we get into, really get into the weeds of this in, in I believe, in quite an interesting way. Yeah, and, and for listeners who have never even heard the term before, I mean, this is not the same thing as being gay, right? So this is not the same thing as a man who has really feminine qualities and just prefers to dress like a woman or, or be feminine. This is a man who historically has been actually pretty masculine, not remarkable in any way in terms of feminine traits, but who actually gets aroused either by cross-dressing or the idea of having a female body or the idea of having female genitals. There's kind of like a broad range of things. Um, so this is a very heated issue within the gender debates. And we talk about activists who seem to be autogynephilic. We talk about the distinction between the sexual propensity and the aggressive and, and kind of violent behavior that we see from some activists. And we really talk about um, how parents might have a compassionate understanding if this might be something their son is going through to help them distinguish between that possibility and other kinds of behavior we see culturally that we find really, you know, unappealing and, and off-putting. So this is probably going to be one of many discussions. We might have Mike back to talk about any updates with the paper. So this is kind of like our first pass and we'll see what happens over the next few weeks with this paper. So here is our conversation with Dr. Mike Bailey. Hi, I'm Stella O'Malley, a psychotherapist in Ireland. And I'm Sasha Ayad, an adolescent therapist in the United States. Through in-depth interviews, personal stories, and psychological exploration, we probe the gender landscape within contemporary culture. And we consider the implications of prioritizing personal identity over other aspects of the self. 
This is the thinking person's take on gender. Join us as we look at gender from a wider lens. Michael Bailey is an American psychologist, behavioral geneticist, and professor at Northwestern University, best known for his work on the origins of sexual orientation. He maintains that sexual orientation is heavily influenced by biology and that male homosexuality is likely inborn. Dr. Bailey's 2003 book, The Man Who Would Be Queen, gave an accessible, compassionate, and intimate account of male sexuality with a focus on gender nonconforming boys, gay men, and male-to-female transsexuals. The book was nominated for an award which was later retracted from the Lambda Literary Foundation, an organization promoting gay literature. Aside from some legitimate critiques of the book and Dr. Bailey's theories, attacks spilled into the realm of the egregious, with a small group of radical trans women viciously going after Mike, his reputation, and his family. All of this was documented thoroughly in Alice Drager's book, Galileo's Middle Finger, which ultimately exonerated Dr. Bailey of the accusations against him. Hello, Stella and Mike. Thank you for joining us. Great to be here. Great to see you again. Hi. So we are talking to you today to kind of cover the, the meat and content of a paper that you published recently with Susanna Diaz. And it's a paper about um, ROGD with a very large sample of parents that you guys t- uh, talked to. And there was also um, in the, the article was considered being retracted. And so right now, Archives of Sexual Behavior is saying that they're going to retract their paper. But we want to talk both about the paper and we want to talk about this possibility of retraction. And there's so much going on in the world of gender right now. So there's a lot to cover. So we're very glad to have you on. Um, And where do you think we should start in terms of understanding this paper and this ROGD uh, survey of parents? What I uh, would propose to do is to start with the history of the paper, then tell you uh, a bit about the paper's findings, and then talk about the uh, reaction to and the attacks on the paper, and then and then I'll maybe uh, say a little bit about the current status. Okay, all right. So the background of this paper uh, began for me in 2018 uh, when I attended a small conference in uh, Toronto. I, was either of you there? I don't remember. I wasn't. No. Okay. All right. Uh, yeah. And there I met uh, Susanna Diaz. Susanna Diaz is a pseudonym. Susanna is uh, the parent of uh, a child uh, she believes has ROGD. Uh, at that conference, it's a very small conference with uh, a few uh, researchers and a few journalists, uh, Susanna made a presentation based upon a survey that she was conducting using the website parentsofrogdkids.com. Uh, this survey uh, was interesting uh, and um, I was impressed and subsequently, I think by email, although it could have been in person, I don't remember, I told Susanna that she should publish this study. Susanna is not an academic uh, and so she didn't really know how one goes about academic publishing. And eventually, we agreed to collaborate on a publication of data that from a survey that she had herself begun. And this paper is the result of that. Could I come in just for anybody who's wondering? So 2018 was a pivotal year. Lisa Littman had released her paper on ROGD, Rapid Onset Gender Dysphoria. And that was, I think, 256 parent reports. And it was it was groundbreaking, but it was also very controversial. There was an awful lot of pushback from activists. And it's my view that Lisa Litt was treated very, very badly. But certainly her 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 study has, has withstood the test of time insofar as years later, 
many of us talk about ROGD. It's it's only got bigger as a concept and, and certainly resonates with thousands of, pa- of parents, if not thousands of people who have gone through a kind of a gender distressed period. And so, Mike, you are coming in in the same year and you'd met this parent of an ROGD mother. So I can see why you thought, OK, let's expand on this. So let's expand on this famous ROGD that Lisa Littman had began. Well, keep going. Yes, uh, when uh, at that conference, Lisa Lippman's paper had not yet been published. Um, so we published this paper uh, in late March. Uh, and again, this paper is based on uh, parental reports, mainly parents. There are a few non-parent guardians on 1800 uh, and 1855, I think, I 55, 65, I don't remember. Uh, adolescent and young adult children uh, who the parents believed have ROGD. Uh, first, that's a lot of people, a lot of 1655. Uh, ROGD youth. 1655. 1655. Thanks for the reminder. Yeah. Okay. So I'm just going to quickly review some of the, what I think are the most interesting and important findings of the paper. Uh, First, um, there's uh, a preponderance of uh, natal females. Three fourths of the youth uh, reported on were born female, one fourth born male. Um, there were interesting differences in uh, the males and females in the expression of the gender dysphoria and the, and the onset. The natal males onsetted two years later than the females um, and were less likely to have socially transitioned or taken steps to socially transition, such as changing their pronouns, changing their uh, gender changing their hairstyle and so on. But they, uh, the natal males were about, were if anything, slightly more likely to have had any kind of medical treatment, uh, which in this sample was mainly hormones. And in this sample, you know, the hormone treatment was not that common. I don't remember right offhand, but I'm going to say it's around 10% or fewer of the youth had had uh, any kind of medical intervention. But um, natal females were about twice as likely to have socially transitioned as natal male, which I think is kind of striking. Okay, so uh, the parents said that these youth had issues. They had emotional problems. And furthermore, the emotional problems preceded any gender problems by about four years. Um, Furthermore, youth with emotional problems were more likely than youth without problems to have socially or medically transitioned. The biggest predictor of transition of both types was having consulted with a gender specialist. And parents tended to say, those who had consulted said that they felt pressured by the gender specialist to transition their children. And I think the last thing uh, I'll say for now about our findings was that parents said, um, after social transition steps, the youth got worse. They did not become happy. They got less happy. So uh, those are the main findings. And uh, I can proceed to talk about the controversy unless you have questions at this point. I think it would be worthwhile to just kind of pause here and and reflect on some of this. Um, I'm I'm trying to do my best to recollect Dr. Lippman's paper. 
And what new information might be gleaned from your research here that maybe we didn't know much about after Dr. Littman published her study? Is there anything that comes top of mind for you? I, I think our uh, results are very consistent with Lisa Littman's uh, research. And there are certain things that she asked about that we did not, uh, things like sexuality, and uh, I think she did ask more about uh, uh, childhood uh, gender nonconformity and, and dysphoria than we did. Uh, I don't remember whether she found the difference that we found about the, the, the sex difference in, um, in uh, transition, uh, uh, which I think is interesting. Um, so, you know, I would say <laughs> largely one could view our study as confirming uh, Lisa Littman's research. And uh, I don't, you know, I'd have to put the two studies side by side and go through and tell you what uh, was especially new about ours. Uh, but, you know, the fact is Lisa Littman's was the first study. Uh, uh, and it was much smaller than ours. Uh, and, you know, it is good to get confirmation, especially about uh, new and controversial uh, research. Yeah. I mean, what's really interesting to me, um, which stands out and really kind of validates what I've been seeing anecdotally, is just that the boys are so much less likely to socially transition and yet ironically more likely perhaps to medicalize. So this is kind of um, just in terms of the, the narrative we're seeing is like boys seem to kind of incubate this sense of identity almost in a somewhat private way. And even sometimes when parents are saying to their son, well, if you're thinking this is who you are, perhaps you want to try on some girls' clothes or this or that. They're actually kind of hesitant or resistant to doing so, but they're very inclined to be pushing for hormonal interventions. Whereas the girls, just from what we're seeing on the ground, are very quick to like want to change their name, change their wardrobe, come out socially. So this is really interesting. And I think this survey kind of confirms what we've seen, which is fascinating. And I'd love to know more about that. Yeah. Um, so um, I, I think I'll uh, start now talking about the controversy. Sure. Is that okay? So uh, shortly after the paper was published, um, I heard that uh, there was uh, upset on the listserv of the International Academy of Sex Research. The International Academy of Sex Research is the organization uh, that used to be, I, I used to call it a scholarly organization. I'm uh, really not inclined to use that uh, adjective right now. Uh, but uh, I was a member of the ISR, a proud member for about 30 years till I resigned in February because it has gone uh, toward uh, identity politics and away from uh, emphasizing scholarship and the pursuit of knowledge regardless of where it leads. Uh, uh, the ISR listserv, uh, including the IS, some of the ISR leadership were uh, upset about the paper for two main broad reasons. First, uh, uh, ethical, can I have to say ethical in, square, in scare quotes, uh, because there is no ethical problem with the study. Uh, they, the claim was made correctly that our study was not reviewed by an institutional review board uh, henceforth, IRB, uh, and that's an ethics review board, but in the U.S., that's what we call them, IRB. Uh, and it was not reviewed by an IRB because um, Susanna Diaz is not an academic. 
Because of that, she is not required to get prior permission to conduct a simple survey. Uh, I, on the other hand, am an academic, and if I conducted a survey without prior ethical approval, I might well get in trouble. Knowing uh, my vulnerability, I consulted my own IRB. Prior to even submitting this article with Susanna, because I don't want to get in trouble, and my IRB uh, told me that Susanna was in the clear and that um, I was also permitted to be involved in this research uh, as long as the data were de-identified, meaning that we can't publish people's names, uh, their emails, anything that somebody could say, oh, I know who that is, you know, that, that would be identified. And of course, you know, in the paper, um, we didn't include any identifying information, although we did include uh, some quotes from people uh, that the quotes that we used were to prove that in general, again, consistent with Lisa Littman's study, in general, the parents who we got information from were on the progressive side. They were not conservative. They were saying things like, oh, I support LGBT. I support trans. I just don't think my child is trans. Stuff like that. Uh, and even in those quotes, we took out anything like uh, ages, mentions of ages, mentions of cities, mentions of doctors that we thought could identify anybody. Uh, but uh, the activists uh, said that uh, because we had, didn't have IRB approval, we were, it was an unethical paper. Uh, if you look at who was going after us, uh, these were not, uh, by and large, ethicists. Uh, these were included a lot of people known to be sympathetic to transgender activism, including some trans activists. For example, the uh, Canadian, uh, I don't know if uh, she is still a graduate student, uh, but Florence Ashley uh, um, and others. Uh, so it, it's not credible that this was about ethics and regardless, there's no ethical problem. The other problem that they mention was methodological because our sample was biased and Susanna's recruitment, uh, I don't know, the description on top of the survey about who should take it, uh, you know, it, it was saying, if you believe, I, I'm, I, this is not the exact words, but essentially, if you believe your child has ROGD, then you should take this survey. survey. Uh, and, the, the, you know, there was some stronger language, uh, you know, I, I, you know, may, something about a cult, perhaps. Uh, now, this obviously is likely to bias the sample in the sense that somebody who doesn't believe that their child has ROGD will be unlikely to take the survey. But that was entirely acknowledged and thoroughly discussed in our paper. And further, and, and you know, so also in addition, these parents need to be studied. And, and people, you know, there's been lots of research of uh, transitioners <laughs> whose Parents who objected to their transition are not being studied. Uh, and uh, furthermore, s some of our most interesting findings don't depend upon that kind of bias. Because recall, we studied differences among our parents. Who was most likely to tr transition, to say that their children were, were transitioned? Well, it was, it was youth with more problems versus youth, 
youth with less problems. Parents who went to see a gender specialist versus parents who didn't go to see a gender specialist. Those kinds of findings cannot be due to the um, selection bias that would have occurred because of the way that we recruited uh, our participants. Uh, so there was, because of, uh, so the ISR, uh, some of the people there were incensed and uh, discussed this and some of the, and the ISR leadership put out a statement uh, sometime in, I think, mid-April, early to mid-April, about their concerns. This led to uh, two additional important things happening. First, an open letter was written and put on the internet calling both for the publisher to retract this paper and also for the editor who accepted it, Ken Zucker, who has been on this podcast, uh, to be fired, to be removed as editor. Uh, this was not the first time these activists have gone after Ken Zucker. Activists like him, like, activists like these, pardon me, uh, did successfully get Ken Zucker fired in, I think, 2016 from uh, the Center for Addiction and Mental Health, uh, his gender clinic there uh, in Toronto. Uh, it was, Ken Zucker is one, one of the most important uh, scientists in the world and therapists in the world uh, treating and studying gender dysphoria. And it was uh, an outrage. And uh, he did win a substantial legal settlement because of that firing. Uh, and um, more recently, uh, I th it was, I don't know, last summer, maybe last spring, last summer, last, last fall, I don't remember. Uh, within the past year or so, uh, on the ISR listserv, this was when I was still a member, uh, activists and academics who were sympathetic to the activists were criticizing Ken Zucker for accepting a paper that offended them. Just one, just to add in as well, and of course, Lisa Lippman's paper was attacked by activists in 2018, and there was, you know, there was a, a big hoo-ha really for six months, eight months, where she had to be retracted and do all this study to come bring it back, and pretty much the very same paper with an additional table was uh, finally published the March after the first publication in August, and and so it's it's a very it feels like a strategy, and it's a very frightening strategy. If you just attack, and if the academics will fold, and it looks like they will, you've got a very strong strategy, because you're going to have a lot fewer, very few people are going to bother going through all that with the knowledge that it's going to get attacked. It's going to be subject to very intense scrutiny, much, much more intense than normal. And so that chilling effect, I don't think we should underestimate how many people go, I meet them. I, I, I couldn't take that scrutiny. It's too much. It's frankly too difficult and pull away. But anyway, keep going, Mike. That, that's all uh, an excellent point, uh, Stella. Um, that is, in, instead of trying to inform a debate with data and reasoning, activists are trying to remove one side of the debate in any way they possibly can. Uh, I, I, I would say, I, I think that uh, Lisa Lippman's paper was never retracted, uh, unless you know differently. I think it was uh, corrected. They made her put a uh, additional information, a correction on it, uh, but it was- You're right, but they passed entirely... the call over yeah, they cast yeah, oh, the ball yeah. over it by a time. Absolutely. Yeah. 
Absolutely. Yes, that's right. They're, they're uh, at least trying to stigmatize research. And so, I mean, the, the, what they like to say, what uh, hostile activists like to say is that such and such research or such and such researcher has been discredited. That's one of their favorite words uh, when uh, that is not true. Uh, and if they succeed in getting our paper retracted, it will not have been discredited. There's nothing incorrect in our paper. Uh, so uh, there was this open letter and uh, the open letter around that time, and I, I don't know whether the open letter had anything to do with this, uh, Springer, which is the publisher, Springer is a huge and very important academic publisher. We're, we're talking, I, I suspect, billions of dollars uh, industry. Uh, they publish... Uh, Journals such as Nature, one of the huge, uh, as well as Archives of Sexual Behavior and many other journals. Springer uh, announced that they were uh, conducting an investigation into the publication of this article. And um, they have announced on the website that uh, there have been methodological concerns. They have uh, changed the paper. They took away um, a supplement that we included with all of the um, all of the uh, statements by parents that we that were rated as relevant to whether they were progressive or conservative, as well as a table that we had included in that article that had several statements. Apparently, somebody thinks that from a statement like, yes, I've always, <laughs> you know, been a, a, a liberal uh, ex until, you know, that that is somehow uh, identifying information. Uh, which is ridiculous. Um, so Springer uh, is investigating, has been investigating the publication. And uh, I did uh, announce on Twitter, so there's no reason not to repeat myself uh, since it's relevant, that I did receive earlier this week, uh, it, would, it would be Tuesday, what is that, the... 23rd, uh, uh, anyway, that um, I did receive an email from the publisher saying that they were going to retract the article. Uh, and I, you can find uh, uh, my Twitter thread about this and lots of uh, discussion about it. Uh, however, uh, I am still hopeful that Springer will not retract our article. And uh, I uh, am not going to say more about that, about the details of possible retraction, uh, the decision and so on right now. I will, I guess I should say one more thing. What, what does it even mean for an article to be retracted? which uh, I've never had an article retracted uh, or, uh, you know, an article uh, that has been threatened with retraction before. So I didn't know I've, I've uh, had to uh, do my own research about this. So if the article uh, is retracted, uh, evidently it will still remain on the publisher's website uh, where it is now. Uh, but there will be a label retracted, and I believe on the uh, uh, electronic copy of the article will be stamped with retracted on every page. 
Uh, and in the future, uh, the publisher will have the um, option, I guess, of making it less available. Uh, it will, you know, the activists will say they won and that our research has been discredited. Oh, I, I apologize. I uh, forgot to mention why, on what basis the publisher said they were going to retract the article. Uh, it was the flimsiest reason I can think of, and it was the alleged lack of informed consent uh, for parent participants. Informed consent is something that is valued, uh, required uh, for uh, by IRBs and so on, uh, but it's more important and relevant for things like this medical procedure that we're going to do might have these benefits, might have these side effects. Do you consent to have this? Not by contrast. Here's a survey. You came to this website because you're concerned that your child may have ROGD. We're going to ask you a bunch of questions about ROGD. And allegedly, when, when another thing that uh, has been mentioned is that parents didn't know that this would result in a publication. Well, at the end of the survey, uh, there is a statement, you know, when when we have enough data, the they'll be will publish on the website. <laughs> yeah. You know, what's the difference between that and an academic publication, first of all? But second of all, informed consent doesn't have to say we're going to publish in academic journals. And finally, all of these parents, every single one of them. Wanted this information out there, mm -hmm. I guarantee mm -hmm. you. Yeah, I mean, I think it's it's so important to just drill this down. If people who had been surveyed were the ones raising these complaints and raising these concerns, it might be worthwhile to go back and double check. Was our informed consent information clear? Did we miscommunicate with these individuals? But really, you have kind of third parties who are activists trying to speak on behalf of the parents when really everybody knows these activists don't actually want these parents to be given a voice at all. So it's just a very manipulative way of, of trying to say you're speaking on behalf of the subject in a survey because you're really not. Exactly. Yes, it, it's craven. Uh, yeah. And not only it, it also uses the shaming tactics that activists use in, in many different ways. So this is a kind of trying to intellectually shame people. And, you know, you've published an awful lot, Mike, so I don't think you'd be easily shamed. But that is the kind of, by putting retraction, like stamped on each page, that would, like anybody who's an up-and-coming scholar, they would just absolutely cringe in the face of that. And frankly, walk away. You, you know what I mean? And so it's very few people who would stand this. It's a very, sh shaming tactic that's the most, powerful and most commonly used by activists, but most powerful for millennia. That's how we've kept society in check. And it's been used in every way, shaming for people asking about genitals, shaming for psychotherapists saying you're not using conversion therapy, and shaming for scholars saying this needs to be retracted because it's methodologically you know, unfit on some level. It's, it's incredibly pernicious. Yes, um, though I, if the worst happens and the paper is retracted, uh, I am going to try to a uh, uh, personal campaign to get retractions like this uh, to be uh, considered badges of honor. Mm. Uh, and that's how I will wear it. I think that's important. I mean, th I'm trying to kind of um, hold two thoughts in my head at once. On one hand, there's this kind of 
anti-intellectual book burning element of what's going on here, which is like suppressing information, trying to silence people who are, you know, investigating an interesting concept. Um, so that uh, in, in that realm, I 100% agree. And as you kind of said on Twitter, Twitter, let's Barbara Streisand this thing, which is the the effect of like the more banned or, you know, off base something is the more curious people get about it and then start to read about it. So I think that's great. I think the other side of this, which I'm really curious about, because I don't have any information about this is like, in in cases when a publication retracts a paper for what you deem as like legitimate reasons can you give examples of like what does that look like how does that usually happen like are retractions often used in this kind of book burning mode or is this actually a legitimate correction mechanism when in science like something's been miscommunicated like talk to us about when is it legit to retract something i believe that there are two legitimate reasons for retraction, neither which remotely applies in the present case. The first is fraud, and that happens. Uh, people make up data, <laughs> uh, and this has happened uh, very visibly. Uh, for example, the uh, Dutch psychologist Diedrich Stoppel uh, made up data for many high profile papers. He just made it up on his computer wow. and published them. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and when that, when that was found, you know, those papers were attracted as they should have been. And uh, earlier there was um, in the 1980s, uh, there was um, a psychologist who made up data in studies of uh, treatment of uh, uh, I, I'm hesitating because I don't know what the uh, allowed language is. Uh, let's say intellectually uh, disabled uh, children, uh, uh, and th this was treatments like medical treatment. He made up data that influenced what people did medically wow. to these. Uh, so this happens, and that's when it. It's I doubt it happens often. When it happens. Uh, it's very serious and it deserves retraction. And the other, uh, and I don't think I know of specific instances when this has happened, but I do think that this is also a valid reason, plagiarism. If I uh, am going to take something you did and put my name on it, uh, you may not want that out there under my name. Uh, so um, increasingly, There are other reasons why articles are being retracted and uh, increasing numbers of avenues for activists to attack papers. And this includes much more arguable kinds of uh, uh, issues such as methodology and, you know, should they have used this data? Um, did they do a good literature review? Uh, and when these kinds of things happen, it's usually with a bunch of people complaining for ideological reasons. And in my opinion, Publishers like Springer should stay yeah. out of this, and they're they're not. Uh, they're they're subject to activist pressure, and that's bad. And uh, you know there there is increasingly dissatisfaction among academics because uh, academic publishers make a ton of money. Yeah. And they make a ton of, fun, of money largely off the backs of academics who give them the papers. They do all the peer reviewing. Maybe an editor will get a little money, but not that much. Mm -hmm. And these academic publishers are making a ton of money. And, and a lot of academics are saying, well, this is ridiculous. And, and finally, also, I should say, 
if you're not an academic, mm -hmm. you try to get access to an academic article and it is likely to be behind a paywall. Yeah. You are likely to be stopped. And that's another thing that a lot of people are outraged about. Uh, so, uh, you know, I think it's a bad business approach to be getting involved in politics and ideological politics. Yeah. And uh, yeah. We hope you're enjoying this episode of our podcast. We work very hard to maintain high quality content for the show. To take an even deeper dive and support the show, join our listener community for access to exclusive content, practical tools and resources supporting gender and identity exploration. We're so grateful to our sponsor, Genspect, an international organization which offers an alternative to WPATH, providing a range of education, resources, and supports to anyone impacted by gender distress Genspect unites many different organizations globally and gives voice to thousands of previously untold stories. For more info, visit genspect.org. And thank you to our sponsor, Rhyme. Rethink Identity Medicine Ethics is a non-profit organization dedicated to improving long-term care for gender-variant individuals. Visit rethinkime.org to learn more. And now back to the conversation. Yeah, I, I, I can imagine that as more information comes ab about regarding your paper, there will be a lot of interest in what happens. Um, as of right now, it's not really clear, and we hope that Springer will not retract it. But um, before we jump into other subjects, w would you be willing to speak with us again when you learn more? Absolutely. Okay. I absolutely, I'll be, uh, you know, about this, but also I just want to say, you know, uh, I will speak to you anytime oh. about anything. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> well, your favorite ice cream flavor is the next topic on the list, so <laughs> just kidding. Okay. But there is, I do want to point out that there is right now a, a publisher's note on the research that says, you know, there is right now saying that their readers are, no, publisher's note, readers are alerted that concerns have been raised regarding methodology as described in this article. The publisher is currently investigating this matter and a further response will follow the conclusion of this investigation. And that dated the 10th of May, 23. So already, you know, there, there's a, arguably a, a shadow being put on it, but, you know, it could get lifted and that would be great if it does. It's, you know, it's an interesting because hopefully academia are aware that there is a pushback and that what they would do in 2018 is hopefully different to what they'll do in 2023. Maybe I'm Pollyanna, but I'm hoping that there'll be a better result this time. Yeah, I hope so. Well, we we would love to speak with you about a couple of things. Um, we took some questions from Twitter, and I know that I was in attendance um, in your fair, the talk that you gave at fair, and there was some really interesting topics that came up. You talked about your paper, and you know, one area that seems to be really concerning to ROGD parents is this idea about boys and autogynophilia. And there's kind of like two, I think two philosophies here that people may not realize can be occurring at the same time, possibly, which is that boys could also be subject to social contagion. There's no reason to think they couldn't. And then also, you know, you have said that your instinct is that a lot of these boys getting wrapped up with a sudden gender identity change might be autogynophilic. Uh, so can you just talk a little bit about that? Because parents are always kind of pushing you on this, I think. Um, and so, yeah, I'd love to hear your thoughts. And yeah, Stella. And Good. Can I add to this big question, because it's a biggie, can I add, do, do, do you believe, Mike, as the, you know, one of the high kings of autogynophilia and one of the experts in this, do you believe that some males through, maybe through overuse of porn or through other means that wouldn't have happened traditionally in autogynophilia, could it be induced? in in the world of very kind of easy access frankly quite disturbing porn that is available or other ways could it be induced in a way that wouldn't have been traditionally seen 
or or even even to be able to be studied in in previous decades. Okay, yeah, uh, I'm delighted to talk about all of that. For the first thing I want to say is that. Uh, although I've repeatedly uh, said that I think it is likely that some too many of the uh, apparently rapid onset uh, adolescent boys uh, likely have autogynephilia. I don't know that. Uh, and I, nobody knows. <laughs> and this is going to require uh, research, uh, some of which uh, I, we have uh we're about to launch, so we'll know more. Uh, I do know uh, some things that are relevant. First, I do know, based on our research, that when you ask autogynephilic adults when your autogynephilia started, it was in you know young adolescence. I know uh, that that uh, when I conducted a Twitter poll, I have many autogynephilic followers. They said that they didn't tell their parents and their parents didn't know. Uh, I know a, uh, a therapist, uh, somebody who I, you may know, uh, and if you knew him, you would respect him. He's a smart guy uh, who uh, sees uh, various kinds, and, and he says that Generally, the adolescents he sees are autogynephilic and his parents don't know. Um, but it is certainly possible that there are non-autogynephilic cases. It would just be difficult to know that as a parent because autogynephilia tends to remain underground. Adolescent boys do not talk to their parents about their sexual fantasies yeah. of any kind, even normal kind. Uh, and uh, so, but, you know, there is some, it is possible that occasionally a parent will discover signs, uh, especially when autogynephilia is accompanied by cross-dressing, wearing uh, mother's or sister's panties, for example. Uh, sometimes uh, parents will... Find that out. I just got an email yesterday from a mother who saw the presentation I did uh, last week uh, and said, I finally know what's going on. And uh, she said uh, that her child was doing this before puberty. Yeah. And also that her husband also had liked to cross-dress. And uh, so, and again, that, this is another thing. I think it's likely genetic. Some people say, well, that's a weird family. They're somehow conveying this on the kid. I don't think so. Uh, but so anyway, um, even among autogynephilic males, there can be social contagion in the sense, not, not social contagion of autogynephilia, but social contagion of transition pressure. That is what our, that's what is omnipresent in our culture now. All trans all the time. It's good to transition. You're her, you're a hero if you're trans and transition. Uh, and I think that's happening uh, uh, in the major three kinds of gender dysphoria, which are child onset autogynephilic, and rapid onset. Of course, rapid onset is only <laughs> social contagion. Uh, it didn't exist except for social contagion. So um, to get to uh, Stella's question about uh, porn, uh, there, there's a lot of interest in this uh, porn, which I still haven't seen, called sissy hypno porn. Uh, but I've I've read a little bit about it now. Uh, so I don't think that it, I don't think autogynephilia is or can be acquired 
by pornography. Uh, I think that sissy hypno porn is, you know, and especially, uh, you know, it's video. Uh, it, it, I, I, again, I haven't seen it. It may be intense. It's, it seems to be uh, very satisfying to a lot of uh, natal males who watch it. Can we just describe what it means for the listener who may not be familiar? So, and, and I'll I'll give you my best shot, and you can add on to it. Okay. So my understanding Please. is that sissy hypno porn is imagery which depicts males being, you know, air quotes, feminized in a sexual way, often degraded, which may be including some humiliation, but really being put in the sexual role of a female, and. I think also there are elements of, you know, a hypnotizing type of imagery, flashing words across the screen or, you know, something that is supposed to kind of lull somebody into a trance and suggesting words. And that's my understanding of it. Um, do you have anything to add or correct there? That's entirely consistent with what I read. Okay. Um, so the erotic elements in that which none of us presumably find erotic uh but that has that is those are all those have all been central to autogynophilic males eroticism since long before the internet existed forced feminization is a big theme in autogynophilic in, in the stories mm -hmm. written by cross-dressers which you can find online if you look. Uh, autogynophilia is often associated with fantasies of having sexual interactions with men, even though uh, I, in the sense that I understand sexual orientation, autogynophilic males are not at all sexually interested in the male body. They're not homosexual or even bisexual in a fundamental orientation sense what they what it what they are aroused by is the idea of being desired by mm -hmm. a man and interacting sexually with a man as a woman or a quasi woman mm -hmm. uh the you know the uh the hypno part i i don't really know if i can speculate whether that adds much or is just uh a way of uh, increasing enjoyment of of this. So, so clearly, you know, if adolescent gender dysphoric males are watching sissy hypno porn, <laughs> uh, and, and I understand that. Uh, a fair number of them are, there's an erotic element. And uh, I think it is most likely the best way to understand this is that they are autogynophilic. They found sissy hypno porn because they looked for it or because they heard about it and it sounded intriguing. Now, watching it, and keeping watching it and talking about people, talking about watching it with pe other people who watch it, that may change their degree of gender dysphoria. I don't know. But I don't think it's likely that it can create autogynophilia in a male who has no aspect of that latent inside. Go ahead, Stella. <laughs> Could I? Yes, thank you. Um, we don't know how many men might have had a bud of autogynophilia within them that never grew. Just like some people might have a gene for schizophrenia, but the you know the life events didn't you know bring it about, or lung cancer propensity towards lung cancer, or something else. So we don't actually know if there was maybe a large number of males who in the right circumstances, autogynophilia could have kind of emerged. There might be another smaller cohort where autogynophilia was always coming out. 
just mm. like you could say with almost with schizophrenia or low cancer. There wasn't, it was just coming out. It was stronger for whatever reason. We're, we're very unsure about nature versus nurture and nurturing the nature and things like that. So we don't actually know, we, we, as far as I know, any idea how many men who could have gone that direction and didn't. We also don't know it about if we come at it a completely different way, which is how much porn is impacting. I've met this way before I got involved with gender. I was meeting a lot of young boys who had got into incredibly disturbing places pornographically uh, through a kind of a, a porn industry that is kind of zeroed in on and targeted, always inducing the illicit, always, you know, offering boys something a little bit weirder, a little bit weirder, a little bit weirder. So where they began and where they ended up was really, really quite shockingly different. And when they pulled away from porn, they went back into what would be called, you know, stereotypically a more normal and satisfying uh, approach to sex. So the impact of porn on all sorts of sexual functioning, you know, if you come at it that way, rather than coming out of the autogynophilic way, coming out of the porn way, it, it could be, these are other questions I think are unanswered really on this. I have been open to the idea that pornography can have various uh, negative effects. I, I think, for example, it's very, it's always seemed very plausible to me that males uh, who watch porn may be less excited uh, at normal sex than they would have otherwise been. However, I have also tried to stay up a bit on the literature, even though it's not what I do. My impression is that uh, concepts like porn addiction and uh, the destructive aspect of pornography have largely not been upheld in the empirical literature. Uh, experts uh, who whose opinion I uh, respect on this include uh, David Lay and... Uh, Gosh, some other people on my uh, sex research listserv. And again, I was entirely open to the possibility. I uh, even added uh, to the listserv some very uh, anti-porn uh, uh, people. Uh, and they never came up with anything convincing. I will say it's kind of hard to do without a controlled study you know, where you would, uh, you know, somehow arrange to make porn available to this set of people, but not to that set of people and compare how they turn out. That's, and, and I'll just say one more thing, then I'll let, give it back to you. You need to remember that porn use, including problematic porn use, it can reflect what's going on with the person. It may not be that the porn is causing something. It may be that the person is causing the problem through porn. So back to you. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm sure it's I, I'm sure it's a little bit of both. And I guess plausibly, we could imagine it going in either direction, right? Like a chicken egg question almost. But I think this is reminding me a little bit of the debates we hear going on right now about, for example, the influence or the harmful impact of technology use or social media use on development, on kids' development. It's like, first of all, the, the changes in the porn industry and the accessibility of porn and the smartphones and the free porn hub, like all of that is relatively new, right? So in the same way that we don't have a ton of information about ROGD and whether or not it's even plausible, like I can imagine that as time goes on and we identify better ways to research these things, we will know more because frankly, a lot has changed in the porn industry and how quickly kids can access porn and what kind of porn they're viewing. Uh, that's relatively new. Um, but, but it's like the same thing with the technology question. Are kids who are more depressed more likely to be using social media? Yeah, probably. But I mean, I think I, I know anecdote does not qualify as like real scientific evidence, but I can just say on a personal level, it's impossible that the, the phone and the way the phone operates has not changed my 
attention span, the way I kind of think about information processing, the way I manage my relationships, like all of these things feel like really important to study, but it's very hard to do, um, as you pointed out, Mike. Um, and, you know, I'm just kind of thinking about the way these internet trends and techno technologically mediated trends end up being caught up with research eventually. Like, you know, I remember when Reddit, the D-Trends Reddit was this really small thing and there were people on the kind of trans activist side saying, we don't have any evidence that detransition is a thing. We have this 1% number, which has its own problems. But, you know, the research is catching up. Like Dr. Littman did a survey of 100 detransitioners. Like it's catching up, but we see it first emerging on these social platforms. So, you know, there are there are lots of forums that I've seen where presumably young men are talking about the way they felt that viewing certain types of porn altered their sense of attraction, their sense of, you know, what they find intriguing or sexually arousing. So, you know, I don't know if they're saying that to make themselves feel better. Maybe it was a nugget that lived in them anyway. But I do think it's interesting because I think sometimes we see the, the mumblings of this stuff online and then maybe 10 years later, we'll be able to research it in a more legitimate, like academic way. Uh, and before you answer, Mike, could I just say mumblings is a very good point, um, Sasha. I know I work a lot with detransitioners and the male detransitioners and the, the growing mumblings about being groomed, being groomed by males around um, humiliation and a lot of fetish stuff, a lot of really quite dark sexual uh, kind of world that I wasn't aware of until the male detransitioners started speaking about it. Now, I know, I anticipate, uh, Mike, that you'll say, yeah, but what was there in the beginning to to be groomed or something like that, you know what I mean? What, but some of these were very young and frankly, you know the phrase feral online, they had kind of such free access at such a young age to such online content and predators came in very young to, to some of these boys. And it seems to have shaped them in, in all sorts of ways. I'm not saying this is all, it's nowhere near all, but it's certainly, it's, it's the mumblings I've really kind of noticed and I'm fearful about. I think it's not being said very much. I think there's a lot of shame attached. Okay. Um... So people have been worried about porn for generations. Uh, and again, and people have been researching this mm. for generations. And again, I am willing to go either way, depending on what the data show. I hope you understand me well enough yeah. by now to know that I have no constituency <laughs> that I ever try to yeah. please. Uh, I am not impressed by any of the data. Also, men like porn of their preferred kind. This porn never matches what a woman would want it to be. No man, no normal straight man has ever gotten really turned on by watching a video of a boy of a, a male bringing flowers to a date and going out to a movie and kissing her good night and saying i can't wait to see you again pornography pornography reflects male sexuality and that's the problem for people who don't like it they don't like male sexuality, which com which includes, you know, hot, casual sex of various kinds. And that doesn't mean that males act on it necessarily. You know, I you're probably familiar with the data. People are not going out and having all kinds of crazy sex. The current generation is having less sex than they used to. If anything, what we have is prolonged adolescence and immaturity. Um, and 
yes, still, I, I don't find credible the idea that this, uh, the informant or the informants that you mentioned were just going along, minding their day, and all of a sudden somebody started grooming them uh, with uh, kinky pornography. I think that they went there. And, you know, they're, if they go there, there are going to be other people there with that uh, interest, including older people who, uh, you know, you can call that grooming if you want. But, um, oh, well, yeah. well, hang on a second, Mike, because I don't want you to be misquoted and misunderstood out of context. I'd be talking about little boys who are, let's say, playing Pokemon. They're 11 or 12. And frankly, if you were going to say what has gone wrong here is, their parents uh, haven't got enough control on the pair on the computer. Uh, and so they're, when I said feral online, they're online in complete free access and uh, predators okay. are, are, are stalking these childy childhood games with little messages that start off the equivalent of sweeties of another generation. I just I hate for people to misunderstand you. You know what I mean? I, I see. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, so yeah, that's a different, we were talking about autogynephilia before. Now I think we're talking about pedophilia, uh, which, you know, I I know that there are pedophilic predators who try to get in there. Uh, you know, I <laughs> that will take us too afar uh, to uh, talk about my research in pedophilia, uh, uh, but I do research there mm -hmm. too. And uh, if, if you ever want to talk about that, I can. But, um, yeah. So, again, uh, back to you. Well, I mean, really, I, I, I would love to just keep talking to you about all of these things. Um, you know, I, I'm thinking about uh, the author Louise Perry, who I don't know if you're familiar with her, but she wrote this great book called The Case Against the Sexual Revolution. And she kind of talks about this, that, like, when our cultural norms kind of include more freedom and more sexuality and, and kind of less restrictions on male sexuality specifically, it can end us end up tipping us in a direction that actually doesn't really benefit women or women's sexual strategies from like an evolutionary perspective. So, I mean, I think that's very interesting and that's an angle that comes to mind as I hear these conversations, especially I notice like sex researchers tend to have uh, what I think is really valuable like this, like until I see the data, I'm not going to believe it. I think we need people like you. And then I think, too, scientific inquiry comes from people who go, yeah, but what if there's this thing going on, even if we have no data about it? Like, I think there's a relationship between yeah. the what ifs and the like, show me the data. So I, I uh, know uh, Louise Perry, I uh, was on her podcast. Oh, right. I think right. I think she's I think she's very smart and interesting. I like her. That said, uh I'm going to send you a link to uh a review of her book uh that I found brilliant by the economist Brian Click Kaplan who questions a lot of her account and I'll just say a couple of objections right now. People who think that male sex it's all about male sexual uh, preferences now are out to lunch. It is scary now for a male <laughs> to be in the world. You can get into so much trouble. All of this stuff regarding, you know, legalistic consent and so on. Uh, you know, talk about being canceled or arrested or whatever uh, in uh, universities in North America um, you know, I think that that's likely part of the uh, problems uh, with uh, the prolonged uh, adolescence, including sexual adolescence of, uh, of the youth nowadays. Um, I think male sexuality is being demonized. Uh, and, you know, I think men can, men can have this probably evolutionary interest in uh, casual sex and uh, pornography without it ruining people's lives. Yeah. <laughs> uh, 
uh, and they can even watch porn occasionally without it ruining people's lives. And the the guys who watch weird porn, they're weird. They're watching it because it does it for them where it doesn't for us. And Sasha, one more thing, because you mentioned this before we get started. And I do, before we finish, I want to make sure that I say it and you can, uh, if you want, uh, weigh in too. Having a weird sexuality like autogynephilia does not make you a bad person. Yeah. It is about your sexual fantasies and what you do with them. It can be limited to that. Mm. I know many a fine autogynephilic person. Mm -hmm. In fact, I know more of them, more autogynephilic uh, individuals who are fine people than I know autogynephilic people who are bad people and the latter try to ruin my life. Yeah. 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 No, I mean, I think that's a really good point. And unfortunately, like I've heard somebody, I don't remember if it was you or someone else say that autogynephilia and the world of the gender debates is sometimes used as like a, a criticism or an accusation almost as though it explains all of this a uh, very like violent, aggressive behavior that we see from some presumably autogynephilic males. There, there are so many autogynephilic males who are are exactly what the ROGD parents describe: sweet, sensitive, thoughtful, caring, shy. You know, a little bit socially awkward. So those things can can exist together in the same person. And I think for for observers on the outside looking in, I mean, as human nature tends to do. Everyone needs to create a villain. And so the autogynephilic male, in, because of so many ways that it's quite taboo, easily fits into that kind of archetype and people can really develop a certain character in their mind that of course is represented by some violent males, but certainly not all. So I just think it's important for observers to make that distinction because if you are a parent or if you're a dysphoric young male and you suspect that autogynephilia is playing a role, the last thing we would want to do is demonize that individual or somebody's son or the, the person who's struggling in this way. The whole point of this is to bring more light to the subject and kind of humanize these people because there are probably different ways that a person can respond if they're having autogynephilic feelings. And I think in the wrong setting with a lot of critique and guilt and shame, it could become violent, it could become aggressive, but then if they're shown, you know, more humanizing understanding of what they're going through, it could go in a much more benign direction. And Stella. could I add before you come in, Mike, could it be, I, I, I believe it's been raised before, could it be that there is maybe a higher proportion of autogynophile men who are narcissistic as well, or who have other you know, issues that make them very, very difficult people, if you follow me. And therefore, we've got a, a growing body of trans widows who are, you know, given an awful lot of stories that are horrendous. And so people are presuming that's the autogynephilic kind of person rather than, well, actually, that could be the narcissistic autogynephile. And it, it reminds me of, let's say, alcoholism. Back in the day, people thought all alcoholics were violent. And now people say, well, actually, some alcoholics are just sitting in the corner drinking and frankly harming themselves, not really harming all that many other people. Um, and some people become violent. Then you'd further it on and say, do most people who become alcoholic end up violent? Because if you keep on going a certain way, you can get further and further into it. Might an awful lot of odd kind of feelings, if I'm saying it right, end up quite narcissistic, does it kind of lead them away into a certain behavior if they indulge it too much, if it, if it takes over their life too much? Yeah, so narcissism reflects high undue self-regard, people who think too much of themselves and are threatened when others do not seem to share that high self-regard. Autogynephilia is sexual arousal by the idea that one is a woman. Those are two completely different things. What we, what I think you're uh, noticing, uh, Stella, which is true, is 
the combination of autogynephilia and narcissism that occurs among many of the most angry trans activists. They have both. They are autogynephilic and they are going to go after you if you're not on board with what they want and how you how they want you to think and talk about them. And uh, back to uh, what Sasha was saying, also related to what you were saying, Stella. Uh, so the most terrible trans activists who are NATO males, the ones who have been trying to beat people up and so on, are almost certainly autogynephilic. <laughs> but it does... It, so. The worst activists are autogynephilic, but that doesn't mean that all autogynephilics are like that. Uh, you know, we got to, and, and I, uh, yeah. And so one last thing, so one last thing, we don't have to discuss it today, but we should at some point is to think about, uh, for, I'll, I'll, I'll say this and you can tell me whether I'm right or not. It seems to me that many of the, parents of ROGD adolescent boys are distressed by the idea that their sons are autogynephilic. And so it's an interesting question. Why? And should they be? Is that, you know, an especially uh, bad thing? <laughs> I mean, given your son is ROGD uh, of some kind, is it worse that he's autogynephilic than some other type? I, I, I don't know. Uh, it's not obvious to me that it's worse, although I could imagine, uh, uh, for example, thinking that, well, if he's autogynephilic, that means that maybe he's going to be more likely to transition. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Maybe. Yeah. Yeah. Because it's, it's so hard to, to resolve in other ways. I mean, it seems to be a torturous experience for those who are having it. Not always, right? But it seems to be really challenging. That's a great question. So maybe what we'll do, and you know, the audience can let us know if they'd be interested in this. When we talk to you again about any updates regarding the paper, we can touch on that. We can talk a little bit about, you know, why uh, are parents so distressed if they think their son might be autogynephilic or considering that that might be a possibility. So yeah, I think that would be great to discuss with you again, Mike. Thank you so much. We really appreciate you coming on to talk about all of these developments and answer questions. Um, we'll see you, I guess, next time. Thank, thank you for everything you do. Oh, thank you. Thanks for joining us this week on Gender, A Wider Lens. Listener support means a lot to us. If you enjoy the show, please like and subscribe on iTunes and leave a review. For more information, visit widerlenspod.com. There you'll learn about joining our listener community, how to contribute to our show, and where to find us on social media. Our discussions are for educational purposes and are not intended as a substitute for mental health services.